section of the scripture. <laughs> okay. Then Jesus told his disciples, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to serve their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? The word of God for the people of God. Morning, everybody. So you've all got your uh, your bingo cards in hand. You're listening carefully. Not only do you have to pay attention to a funny accent, but now there's a game involved as well. Excellent, excellent. Hey, you've heard the uh, the rules already as Carrie explained them. So as we go through, you'll hear some words, and uh, and you can strike them off your game card there. When we get uh, to the point where where you've got all those words, maybe please, please, please feel free to shut out the word bingo, okay? But keep your seats and go and find Carrie after the service. Everybody got that? All right. As they would say in the bingo halls back home, eyes down. All right. <laughs> So you know that uh, you know by now that that I love to watch soccer. That I have one team that I follow in particular. You've heard enough about that. But the truth of my life is this: and while I love watching soccer, I was never really that good at playing it. I mean, I would go out into the playground at school every day as a boy. But as I got a little bit bigger, I realized that God had put me together for a different sport: <laughs> rugby. I played rugby for about 25 years of my life. We may have a few pictures that could come up on screen here. There you go. That's one of the best days of my life. I'll tell you about that sometime. Uh, what else we got? Proof that I actually played the game, didn't just have pictures afterwards. And there we are. That, that was the captain of that team. We had a great time. And uh, one from my youth, I think, as well. There it is. That's when I was 18 years old, all that time ago. Hey, I played rugby for 25 years. It was a, a long, long time of my life, but a time that I miss very much. And in rugby, we have two sets of players who have distinctive roles and who, as a result, are very different in their approach to playing the game. In the same way as in American football, you guys have an offense and a defense. We have two sets of players as well. We have forwards and we have backs. I'm going to tell you a little bit about them. The forwards in general are the bigger, more burly, slower, slightly less fit players of the game, <laughs> whose, whose job it is to do battle against the other team's forwards so that the ball can be recycled and can be given to the other set of players, the backs. The backs, by contrast to the forwards, are the slimmer, lighter on their feet, speedier players whose job it is to receive the ball after the forwards have done all the hard work, of course, and gracefully evade tackles so that they can advance deeper into opposition territory. When they do eventually get tackled, the forwards 
when they catch up with the play, go into battle once more and recycle the ball again for the backs. Now, if that's all double dutch to you, that really doesn't matter. The main thing that you have to pay attention to for this illustration to work is that forwards and backs are different. Has everybody got that? For forwards, read big, burly, slow, and unfit. And we love nothing more than to wrestle and do battle with our opposition forwards. Backs, they are speedy. They are slimmer. They are lighter on their feet. They're slightly better looking. And they love nothing more. They love nothing more than to dance around with the ball looking good. And they rarely have a hair out of place. I was a forward. And I was a reasonable forward too. I knew how to do my work each week on the field. I I knew that my job was important, that the game could not be played without me and the other forwards like me. I was built for it. I was big. I was burly. I was slow. I was really, really, really unfit. And I loved it. But deep down, deep, deep down, I always wanted to be one of those backs too. I wanted to be faster. I wanted to be lighter on my feet. I wanted to be fitter. I wanted to dance around the field with the ball in my hand. Even though I enjoyed rugby a great deal, there was always this part of me that wanted what I could not have. There was always this part of me that yearned to have or to be something more than what I was. In truth, I absolutely loved playing rugby. I miss it to this day, but there was always this niggling discontent within too about the position that I played in. This idea of wanting more, of wanting to be more, wanting to achieve more, is one that we are familiar with here. It's part of the DNA of this nation, of course. We all know that as we, in our understanding of the American dream. That is that we can be more, that we can achieve more than what we are or what we have achieved so far. There can be no doubting that this is still a great land of great opportunity. It's a land that drew myself and my family to move here five years ago. That aspect of the American dream is still healthy. But for many, many people, there's another side to this American dream, which has more to do with a desire for achieving success and satisfying the desire for material possessions. It is the opportunity to pursue more than what we have, to gain more than what we have. And we now have a tendency in our society and in our culture to measure our level of success by the stuff that we possess. The love of money and the things money can buy is a primary and secondary motive behind much of what we do. We want to consume. We want to acquire and buy our way to happiness. And when do we want to do it, friends? Now. We do this with so many things, right? Think about the relationship that many of us have with our cell phone. You know, Apple are just releasing their newest version of the iPhone, and there will be lines of people outside Apple stores all over the United States who are eager to extend their cell phone debt by exchanging their perfectly good and working older iPhone so that they can have the new one. Our children are learning this too. In the parsonage in the last month, we decided that it was time to enter that world of Fortnite. Now, for those of you who are not gaming savvy, Fortnite is the latest gaming craze that is taking the world by storm. It goes something like this. You download the game. You start to play then you realize that you need something more in the game. Now, back in the day when I played video games, if you needed something more in the game, you played and you played and you played until you found what you wanted or you won what you wanted, right? Nuh-uh, no more, okay? Nowadays, you can buy currency in the game so that you can purchase whatever it is you need for the game, right? Last week, I made a purchase so that Jackson could have some V-Bucks and get a new skin, whatever that means. (laughs) 
Or what about if we are in a store with our younger children and we make the mistake of walking past the toy aisle and they start to ask if they can have a new toy. It doesn't matter that they have six million toys in their playrooms already. They have seen something that they want, no, they need. And when do they want and need it? That's right. The idea that we can work hard and achieve our goals and dreams is the very, very best of the American dream. But the reality is that our culture of instant gratification and the wide availability of credit means that the American dream for some has turned into an American nightmare. And that is because of two distinct yet related illnesses that affect our society and in many cases our spirituality. Affluenza is the first one. Affluenza is the constant need for more, bigger and better stuff. It's the desire to acquire and most of us have been infected by this to some degree. Here's an example. In 1973, the average size of an American home was 1,660 square feet. Fast forward to 2016, and that average home size has become 2,700 square feet. A change of 1,100 square feet in just about, what, 33, 43 years. And the thing about that is that even though we have all of that space, we still don't have enough room for all of our stuff. Did you know that there is an estimated 2.3 billion 2.3 billion square feet of self-storage space in America these days. That means that we have built bigger houses and we still don't have enough room for all the stuff that we don't want, so we are prepared to pay for space to put that stuff in. It's crazy, right? Credititis is an illness that is brought on by the opportunity to buy now and pay when. And it feeds on our desire for instant gratification. Our economy today is built on the concept of credititis. And unfortunately, it has exploited our lack of self-discipline and has allowed us to feed our affluenza, wreaking havoc on our personal finances in some cases, and of course, our national finances too. Another example, in 1990, the average credit card debt was around $3,000. Today, according to nerdwallet.com, average credit card debt is at $17,000. Credititis is not limited to purchases made with credit cards either. It extends to loans for, and mortgages and, and other loans. The life of the average car loan and home mortgage continues to increase while the average American's savings rate continues to decline. We have an alarming number of people in this nation who are not preparing for their futures, who cannot afford to save for them. There is a problem and it all points to a deeper problem within. There is a spiritual issue behind both affluenza and credititis. You see, friends, our souls were created in the image of God, but they have been distorted. We were meant to desire God, but we have turned that desire towards possessions. We were meant to find our security in God, but we find it in amassing wealth. We were meant to love people, but instead we compete with people. We were meant to enjoy the simple pleasures in life, but we busy ourselves pursuing money and things. We were meant to be generous and to share with those in need, but we selfishly hoard our resources for ourselves. All of us, all of us, all of us have this inclination towards sin. And the devil plays upon this inclination towards sin. Jesus said that the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy, but that I have come so that they may have life and have it abundantly. You know, in order to destroy us, the devil doesn't need to tempt us to do drugs or to steal or to have an extramarital affair. All he needs to do is to convince us to keep pursuing the American dream in this way, to keep up with the Joneses, to borrow against our futures, to enjoy more that we can afford and to indulge ourselves here and now. We have a spiritual problem with sin. Amen? 
But the Bible offers to us a solution. And this is it, that we need a heart change. Although we receive a changed heart when we accept Christ, in a sense, we need a changed heart every single morning. Each morning, we need to get down on our knees and say, Lord, help me to be the person that you want me to be today. Take away the desires that shouldn't be there and help me to be single-minded in my focus and pursuit of you. You see, as we pray a prayer like that and act on it, God comes and cleanses us from the inside out, purifying us and changing our hearts. As we say a prayer like this, as we present ourselves daily before God, we draw closer to God the Son, Jesus Christ. And as we draw closer to Him, we become increasingly willing to take up our crosses and follow Him. We become more and more willing to follow Jesus regardless of what it costs. We realize the futility of always chasing after more stuff, thinking that it will be that which brings us peace and joy. And we start to understand why Jesus asked, what would it profit us if we were to gain the whole world but forfeit our lives? My friends, we must allow Christ to work within us. Christ works in us as we seek first his kingdom and strive to do his will. And as we do, we begin to sense a higher calling, a calling to simplicity and faithfulness and generosity. And we begin to look at ways that we can make a difference with our time and our talents and our resources. By pursuing good financial practices, we free ourselves from this cycle of debt so that we are able to be in mission to the world. And a key part of finding financial and spiritual freedom is found in simplicity and exercising restraint. Because with the help of God, we can simplify our lives and silence the voices constantly telling us that we need more. With the help of God, we can live counterculturally by living below and not above our means. With the help of God, we can build into our budget the money to buy with cash instead of credit. With the help of God, we can build into our budget what we need to live generously and faithfully. Now, over the coming weeks, we're going to be looking at what it means to find joy through living lives of simplicity and generosity. We're going to unpack this idea that by finding contentment with what we have, by ceasing this unholy pursuit of more and more material stuff, we actually free ourselves from that rat race and we place ourselves in a better position to live generously and to support God's work in the world through our giving. Throughout this month, these worship services are forming part of our annual stewardship campaign. The ta- Say again. Oh, really? Not yet. Not yet. We, we're going to have a domestic argument right here. <laughs> Let's rewind. Throughout this month, these worship services are forming part of our annual stewardship campaign. The time when we invite every person in this grace-filled family to pray and to seek God as to how we might each support the amazing missions and ministries of this church. Because this is an exciting time to be a part of what's happening here, Right? See, over these last three months, I've met with so many of you. I've had time to visit and to listen to what God has been doing here, what God is doing among us here and now. In almost every single one of those meetings, I have heard from you about your excitement at what God is leading us to in the coming months and years. There's an air of expectation around this church at the minute, a sense that we are on the cusp of something even more amazing than what it is is here and now. And we want to be that grace-filled family. Amen, church? We want to be that place through which our friends and neighbors and the people of this community can come to know Christ and have their lives transformed by love. 
We want to be a church that is making deeply rooted disciples who are reaching out into the world, serving in the name and spirit of Christ our Master, and making a difference in the lives of the communities we touch. Now, you can see already today, our worship numbers are strong. Our classes are also full of people who are seeking to grow in their walks with Christ. Our children's and youth ministries are both flourishing. These children and young people are growing up knowing what it means to be part of a worshiping church, knowing what it means to gather in worship. And our commitment to supporting the work of missions here and overseas continues to be strong. Did you know that in the last 12 months, your gifts towards mission have totaled almost $100,000. And that is money over and above our operating budget money. Amen. Give yourselves a pat on the back. Not only all of this good stuff, but we also have hopes for the future too. We are at capacity in Maxwell Hall. We are almost at capacity at our 11 o'clock service on Sunday mornings. We have no more room to grow. So we need to do something about that so that we can keep growing and can keep making disciples in this place. Amen? Amen. Take a look around you. I love this place, but we've got some work to do to brighten and spruce this place up a little bit, right? We have. It's all ahead of us. And not only that, but we are hungry, hungry, hungry to be out and about in this community and in the world, being the hands and feet and Christ, committed to making a difference wherever we are. Amen? Amen. And this can only be done, friends, when each of us brings what we can to support the work of God in and through this place. We are well positioned to take the next faithful steps in Memorial's almost 200-year-old story. We are in a strong financial position currently. All of our operating expenses are being met this year so far. Don't stop giving. Our efforts to pay off remaining debt after the work to restore the sanctuary is also going well. And our finance team is committed to ensuring that this continues. We have amazing lay leadership at this church. I have been so impressed in this first three months with the existing leadership capacity that Memorial United Methodist this church has. And I don't know if you're completely aware of this or not, but we have a quite brilliant staff team in this church. In every, yes, go ahead. In every single position here, we have individuals who are bringing expertise and experience to fulfill the pastoral program and the administrative needs of running a church of this size. They are great people who love the Lord and who love this church. And they want to make a difference in this community and in the world. We are extremely blessed to have them all on board and we need them as we walk into this exciting future together. My friends, I have to confess that normally stewardship month is not my most excitable time in the pulpit. Every time I preach during a stewardship campaign, I am painfully aware of the fact that people don't like to hear the preacher preaching about money, much less ask them for it. I get that. Because I'm a real person too. I have a real paycheck at the same times every month. And I have to make that paycheck work in my household too. But you know what? It's different this year. This air of excitement and expectation about what's next at Memorial, well, it actually has me buzzing a little bit inside. I am pumped to see what happens here in the months and the years ahead. I am pumped to get behind it and support it uh, myself. And I am pumped to ask you to support it too. So this week, you'll all hopefully receive a letter from me along with a number of other bits of paper, including a narrative budget for the coming year, a giving guide to help you think through your plans for 2019, and of course, an estimate of giving card, also known as a pledge card. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to receive this pack later in the week. And, and this is what it's for. It's based in prayer. And it is our prayer, very much so, 
that you will read everything in this, this pack, that you'll remember this little moment of joy together, and that you will begin to pray through about how you might support the work of what's happening in this church over the coming year. We're going to start that process today. In your bulletins, you were given a little sticky note. And, uh, and on those sticky notes, I'm going to invite you to write a response to a question that I'm going to give you in a, in a couple of minutes. And then later on, as we um, get up and make our way forward for...